Good morning and welcome to Evangel Church Online, a safe place for everyone to explore faith in Jesus. And this morning, we're going to dive deep into what it truly means to be born again. Do you live a second life? Find out soon. Well, we are a week away from Easter now. Yeah, it's Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. Well, when we think about Easter, and maybe this is, you know, taking over your shopping list already this mm -hmm. week, it is Easter egg hunt supplies. Yes. Candy. <laughs> now, not all candy is good. Not all Easter candy is good. True. Some of it's downright disgusting. Mm -hmm. So what is the Easter egg candy or Easter egg hunt candy that you go for first? Oh, easy. Hands down, always mini eggs. Okay. Mini eggs, like they're just a supreme Easter season candy. They are, but which mini eggs? Yeah, good question. Um, for those of you who like eggies, I'm so sorry to tell you that you have chosen the wrong egg type chocolates. Um, because they're just like the off-brand version of mini eggs. Yeah. Um, one time my mom for Easter bought us um, mini eggs that had Pop Rocks in them. And not like flavored, so they didn't yeah. like, taste like anything. But they would like crackle. And I I love them. Because you get like the crackle of the shell and the crackle of the Pop Rocks. Um, and I've never seen them again. It was like a one-year thing. I think that Cadbury used to have like chocolate bars with Pop Rocks in them as huh. well. Yeah, I am with you. Uh, no imitation mini eggs, it has to be yep. Cadbury, yep. which is the superior chocolate that you can get at checkout. I mean, it there are true. other really good chocolates, but they're not like at the checkout. Mm -hmm. So Cadbury mini eggs only, yep. but I also really love the O. Henry eggs. Oh, like the yeah, bigger that's a, ones. Those are like kind of a silent yes. like, favorite as well. I look for those. Um, my my grandma and my and my family are like we're like really into um, Purdy's, and so Purdy's does like a peanut buttery chocolate egg thing as well, um, and so yeah, those are those ones are so good. They are okay. Really quickly, least favorite. Oh, Peeps for sure. Are there in the comments? Are there any Peeps fans? Because <laughs> if you are a Peeps fan, we're sorry. Of those like weird spongy marshmallow like egg things. Yes. Um, convince me, why are they good? Like, what do you like about them? Yeah, they're like gritty on your teeth. And, and just like all around not awesome. Yeah, they're not really appealing all the way either. But I have to say, so we are a big like jube jube mm -hmm. gummy candy family. We really like it, but yep. something about the Easter ones always, they do weird flavors. Yeah. Yeah. Like just stick, like if, if you're watching this, candy makers, um, just stick to the normal ones, you know? We like want we don't the need licorice to invent. ones. Yeah, we don't we need to like flavor. reinvent the wheel of candy. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, but we want to hear what your um, kind of Easter candy is. Um, whether you're an Aggies fan, we'll forgive you. Um, up to, you know, like the bougie, purdies uh, type, but we want to know what yours are. Um, and so share in the comments below. We'd love to just kind of get a get a conversation going, get it started. Um, just have some lighthearted fun uh, before we jump into our message. Yeah. Well, let's pass it off to Pastor Lucas. Well, welcome guys. My name is Lucas. I'm one of the pastors here at Evangel. If you're new with us, we're actually going through a series called The Gospel of John. And today in John chapter 3, we begin chapter 3 and we're kind of introduced to this man. His name is Nicodemus. He, he's a rich man. He's an affluent man. He has influence from the outside looking in. It seems like he has um, things all figured out. But we see him here and, and he sees the activities of Jesus, the, the teachings of Jesus, the public ministry of Jesus. And it's kind of shaken him a little bit. It's stirred up some questions and it's uncovered some Things that he's been thinking about now in terms of eternal things, existential questions. And my question for you today is, is have you been there? Have you had moments in your life where all of a sudden some of the bigger questions of life have bubbled to the surface and you're looking for some semblance of truth, some semblance of what you can kind of put some feet on, some solid ground you can put some feet on? I know for me, I've had many places in my life where I've had these markers, these moments where 
I was kind of roused out of the routine of life and had to begin to think thoughtfully and with a little bit of desperation about what is true in this world and even beyond this world. Now, for some of us, as we take that journey, for some of us, the answer that comes is untenable. Uh, and for others of us, it actually changes our perspectives and changes not just our perspectives, but changes our lives. And so we're going to kind of dig into, so if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 3, verse 1, as we introduce you to this man named Nicodemus, and this moment he has, this night he has with Jesus, as they begin to talk about kind of those bigger existential questions, and Jesus uh, unpacks some beautiful truths here. So let's dig in. So John chapter 3, starting verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, visit myevangel.church forward slash Bible, and everything is there to get you set up. So now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, now underline that little born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now here we're introduced to Nicodemus. He's a ruler among the Jews. He's part of the elite of the of Pharisees, and he comes to Jesus at night. Now, it's interesting. I've heard so many things around this whole idea of, of him coming to Jesus at night. And, and one of the common kind of things that I've heard even growing up was he came to Jesus at night because he was ashamed. He didn't want to be seen publicly coming to Jesus. Now, that could be the case. That could be part of why he comes to Jesus at night. But, but there's also another practice among the Jews uh, particularly the rabbis, the scholars, the teachers, they had their public ministry, which was uh, a full schedule during the day with the people that they were leading and teaching. But then they had this practice of doing some uh, study, uh, deeper dialogue with peers. Those things happened oftentimes at night. And so, you know, perhaps it was a little bit of both. We, we don't fully know why Nicodemus came at night. That uh, could have been because he was ashamed. It could have been because he just wanted to have like really good set aside time to really dig into matters as was, was part of the tradition of that time. Um, kind of speaks to any dynamic out there for those of you maybe exploring faith. Uh, maybe you're, you're here and, and you wouldn't maybe come through the doors of a church because you don't want to be seen to do that. But you are curious and that's okay. Either way, it was just what happened. Now, whatever the reason... He, he comes to Jesus with an observation. Now, when you read this encounter, you might think that Jesus kind of discounts his observation because it doesn't feel like Jesus actually responds to what he says. So let's just, let's just read it here. John 3, uh, 2, the, the latter part of uh, verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And, and Jesus responds to him in a way that is, it feels very cryptic maybe for Nicodemus, and maybe even feels out of left field. Now, before we read it, I would encourage you to listen to last week's sermon by Pastor Marcus. If you missed that, I encourage you to go back, watch that, and then come back to this. Because there's this moment where Jesus and the writer of John is trying to convince his readers that Jesus is the sign that we've been looking for. He's not just a sign or we're looking at the miracles and the signs that he did as the means to an end. We're looking at Jesus as the sign. So then Jesus responds in this way and, and, and it kind of turns our eyes away from the signs and the miracles that he's been doing. And it kind of points them to where they need to be pointed. So verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot underline this, see the kingdom. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And in a moment, he's going to unpack what he means by that in, in a bit of a follow-up. But I want you to look at verse 5 now. He's, he follows up as, as Nicodemus kind of pushes back on that. He follows up with, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, and underline this, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We got these two pieces. 
He cannot see the kingdom of God and he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now notice both seeing and entering the kingdom of God involve this moment of new birth or being born again. William Barclay, he writes this, There is a warning here for every one of us. It is easy to sit in discussion groups, to sit in a study and to read books. It's easy to discuss the intellectual truth of Christianity. But the essential thing is to experience the power of Christianity. And it is fatally easy to start at the wrong end and to think of Christianity as something to be discussed, not as something to be experienced. You see, Nicodemus was that guy. He was well-versed in the scriptures, in the law. He was well-versed in being part of the debates and the discussions of spiritual things. And in fact, he was a leader among the religious elite of the day. So what, what is he missing? Because he comes to Jesus with an angst. He comes to Jesus with some doubts and some questions. And, and Jesus has kind of stirred this up in him. It's kind of bubbled to the surface. And though he is well-respected among his peers, there's something missing. He must be born again. So, so what does that even mean? And Nicodemus, he asked that very question. Let, let's continue in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, there's kind of two ways that you can take Nicodemus' response here. Uh, one, uh, perhaps he heard Jesus in just a literal sense and he just doesn't get it. Like, you know, how is it possible for a full grown man to go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Maybe he's taking it literally, but personally, I don't really buy that. This is a smart man. This is a man who spent his life studying the scriptures and, and pursuing truth and thinking thoughtfully about spiritual things. In fact, the metaphor of being born again or new birth was, was not lost on first century Judaism. This is a metaphor. This is kind of a thing that was spoken of. And, and even among the Gentiles, uh, th there's a history of this idea, this metaphor, this picture of being born again, new birth, as, as a picture of spiritual uh, change and renewal. And so I think that perhaps his response here is coming from a different place. Notice he says in verse 3, how, how can a man be born when he is old? Now the word used here when he says old literally means old man. And perhaps I can maybe reframe the question here to help us out. Perhaps he's asking, how can a man or woman be born again when he or she is old and set in their patterns, their beliefs, and their biases. Perhaps like you're, you're like Nicodemus, you're, you're thinking the same thing. I, I'm pretty settled in my worldview and the way I see and experience the world. How, how would it be possible for me to have new birth? And so there's this question like how? How can we change our worldview? And, and this actually becomes the point of what Jesus says next. I, I really think that this is... Jesus is going deeper than um, just uh, Nicodemus asking an, in, in, you know, an inane question about, you know, literally born again. I think that there's something deeper going on here. So verse 5, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now Jesus here, he, he reiterates what he's already said, but, but now he gives a you know, greater explanation and definition of the idea of being born again, this prerequisite to seeing and experiencing, seeing and entering the kingdom of God. He says, your, your paradigm, your worldview, your limited vision is a result of the flesh trying to perceive what is spiritual. The, the flesh gives birth to flesh. In other words, you can only see this world through the framework of this world. And in fact, it's even worse than that, really. 
because you can only see the framework of this world through a framework that's been shaped by your experiences, your education, your family of origin, and, and the like. So you have this limited view, and, and the reality is flesh can only see what, what flesh can see. Living in this world, you can only see what living in this world allows you to see. Our, our vision is limited, and that limited vision is a result of our separation from God, our Creator, and His kingdom. So why, why are some of you perhaps exploring faith today? Because I think that there's this knowing, both in your head, okay, sometimes we just say, oh, this is just a deep knowing in my heart. No, there, there's both. There's intellectually as well as um, spiritually within your heart and your soul. You know that there's more to this existence than, than you can just see. And the Christian faith that presents an invitation. Jesus extends an invitation to go beyond the things of this world to a deeper reality and understanding of your existence. But the question is, how does that happen? Because if flesh only gives birth to flesh, if you can only uh, see the world through a world view that is of this world, how do we see and enter a kingdom of God that is spiritual? Well, Jesus speaks of this mystery and of that process. He says in verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, we may listen and, and, and think about this, you know, and go, wow, this is, you know, this seems even more cryptic than, than anything else Jesus has said. But, but I really think that Nicodemus would have understood what Jesus is alluding to here. You know, the word wind that he uses is the word pneuma. And it has a few layers of meaning. One, one, one could, you know, speak in terms of wind, but it also carried this idea of breath and spirit. And, and Nicodemus, as, as a teacher of the law, would have understood the nuance here because he would have immediately thought back to that moment of breath. As, as speaking to new life, new birth, he would have went right back to Genesis where, where God creates Adam and he comes and he breathes, pneuma into his nostrils and gives him life. He would have understood what's going on here. But even with that understanding, it leaves us with a ton of mystery. Now, recently I, I listened to a uh, lecture by uh, Elf Dealey, who's a professor uh, for graduate studies at Summit Pacific College. And it was, it was interesting the way he did it. I'm gonna paraphrase this a little bit. But, but he spoke of, of the scripture um, often gives us the dots, okay? So just picture these dots. I mean, who's ever done a connect the dots? Remember those back in the day? And so there's this moment where Scripture kind of unpacks the dots, and we kind of see these dots, but we don't always see what connects them. So for, for instance, you know, we would say something like God is sovereign. It means God is in control. He is king over all. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. God is, is sovereign, Yet, even with that knowledge, we don't always see what connects in terms of how he plays out his sovereignty in our story and in the story of humanity. We don't always understand and fully appreciate and know the plan and how that all connects. And that's, that's the space for faith. Unfortunately, uh, Christianity does require faith. Because we don't have all the answers. And that can be such a tension kind of for us to play out in everyday life. But, but the same goes for those being led by the Spirit in this idea of new birth. Remember, we're talking in the context of new birth. This idea of being born again. And Jesus begins to speak of the work of the Spirit in that process. And what we can say is, is we don't know where the wind goes or where it's coming. In other words, we can see evidence of the working of the Spirit. We can see the dots, but we can't always connect how those kind of work out. And when the breath of God sovereignly is, is breathed into a soul, and there's a revelation of Jesus. And for some of you, you're watching this, and maybe you're exploring faith, and we're so glad that you're here. But I'm really praying 
because it's, it's, it's one thing to hear stuff like this, a sermon, and, and hear truth being preached, but really the working is the mystery of those dots getting connected. And those dots getting connected is the work of the Spirit as the Spirit kind of does something in you and reveals Jesus to you in a very personal way. And that's the mystery of this gospel. If, if it was as easy as just coming up with a really good intellectual argument, then I think we, we would all kind of just go that way. But the reality is many of us are, are touched by the Spirit, both in our intellect, but also in our hearts. And there's this, this, this mystery of the wind blowing into us and giving us revelation and, and, and bringing us into this place of new birth as we accept Jesus and as we realize our sin and our brokenness. And, and my prayer for you is that you would have that experience, that it would be more than just, you know, making just a, a decision based on what you're hearing, but rather there just be a personal moment with the Spirit. And that's part of this idea of what Nicodemus is missing here. He's looking for the Spirit to breathe new life into him and to bring alive the truths of, of him sitting even across from Jesus as the Son of God. And we're going to see that as we kind of continue this series that we do see Nicodemus come up again. And it seems as though he's had that experience later following this dialogue and this time with Jesus. I kind of like that this remains a mystery. Um, many of us watching right now, you, you have, you've been included in this mysterious act of the Spirit, choosing you to reveal Jesus, and it changed everything for you. Uh, he chose me, and it changed everything for me. It, it, it's, it's a mystery. It's a grace. It's it's a humbling thought to know that we know Jesus because without the Spirit moving and breathing, we wouldn't have this opportunity. But for today, we're going to conclude with this because we can go on and, and, and we're talking right now a lot about the how, the where, the when, the why, the, the how. But, but we're, next, next two weeks from now, we're going to talk and continue this story and we're going to talk about the why. And, and the why is beautiful. I'll give you a hint. The why is, is love. But for now, we're going to be talking about the how. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? That's the question. You can even underline that. And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, we bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can I believe if how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who is descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so it must the Son of God be, so must the Son of God be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. How can these things be? Now we can read this question in two ways. We can, we can read it as a bit of an incredulous rhetorical question. Maybe a, a rhetorical question of unbelief. Or, or we can perhaps read this as, as legitimately pursuing it. Like, how can this happen? Like, how can this be that we would be born again, that we would have new birth? And Jesus' response to Nicodemus gives us a bit of a clue. And, and like so many things, the question maybe came from both camps. A bit, bit rhetorical, but also a bit of an um, investigation question. Because he starts with a rebuke, and then he speaks to the how. He starts with a rebuke. He says, you know, how, how can you... You know, how can you understand if you don't even understand natural things? How, how can you understand spiritual things? There's this bit of moment of rebuke, but then he goes on to say, but, but as, as Moses is lift, has lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is pointing us 
to this moment as we fast forward his life and, and we have the beauty of a, a reverse perspective and we get to see this imagery play out. So Nic Nicodemus would have understood this moment and as he spoke of, of the snake being raised up on the pole and those that looked at it were healed. Those that looked at it were, were given a, a new lease on life, so to speak. And Jesus is alluding now to where he is going to be brought up to, the, to Golgotha. And he's going to be put up on a cross. And he's going to be elevated above the crowd for everyone to see. And so I'm sure Nicodemus, as he witnesses this later, because we do see that he seems sympathetic to Jesus after Jesus' death and burial, that maybe in that moment he saw that and he remembers this conversation. He goes, wait a second, this is who I'm looking to. This is the Savior. This is the Messiah. And this is what it means. So for each of us, as we are confronted with the story, with the good news, we call it the gospel, the good news of what Jesus did. We have to kind of realize that in our angst, in our tension, as we look to this world to kind of give us bigger answers than, than seem to be satisfied in our souls, we, we get kind of that angst bubbling up in us. And, and like Nicodemus, you may take a season where you turn to Jesus and you visit him at night and you go, Jesus, how can I be saved? And he speaks of himself as the sign that God sent his son. And we're going to speak to that why next in two weeks. But for today, the how is Jesus. The how is Jesus on that cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And there's a mystery. I can say that until I'm blue in my, in, in my face, but there's a mystery of that truth. And then the truth that the spirit of God is here in this world bringing people to Jesus. There's those, those truths, those, those ideas, and, and yet we don't see how they connect. The working of the Spirit remains a bit of a mystery to us. But my prayer is in the midst of that mystery, some of you hearing this today, he's moving and he's working in you. He's doing that mysterious introduction to Jesus in your spirit. And there's something happening, you're becoming alive. You're seeing things freshly for the first time. And really all that is, is, is coming to a realization. We can break down the dots, but remember the spirit is the one doing the work in the midst of this, but the, the, the dots are this. We come to this realization that we have great need. <laughs> we have great need. And, and, and then this realization that, that we're, we are sinners and that God is holy and righteous, but he sent his son because he loved the world. And as his son was died and was buried and rose again, he conquered death and sin. And he gives us this doorway, this pathway to new life, to being born again. And it is a mystery, but it's a beautiful mystery. And for some of you, perhaps even today, you'll experience that mystery for yourselves. So let me just pray with you today. Lord, we just thank you for the story of Nicodemus. This man that kind of had his life figured out. He had all the pieces in place, so it seemed. And yet you came on the scene and you kind of shook him up. And he began to realize that he had a tension and an angst that he just couldn't fully verbalize. And he comes to you and Lord, you spoke to him. Lord, yes, you, you corrected him, you kind of pushed on him, but you also, Lord God, revealed that you are indeed the Messiah, the one he was waiting for, the one that could once and for all reconnect him with his creator that he so desired to know. And God, I pray for everyone here listening that, Lord, for those of us that have experienced that moment of salvation, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we just, we come back to that moment of first love, that moment of being so humbled to know that your spirit sought us out and led us to Jesus. And we had the opportunity to just walk into the mystery of this new birth and this new life, Lord. But we also pray for those exploring faith today. 
that God, you would, by your spirit, you would reach each and every one of them as well. That God, them coming to Jesus would not just be something that's forced, would not be something that just comes out of guilt or shame, but Lord, that rather it would be out of this beautiful mystery and moment of realizing that Jesus is the Son of God who loves them and has a new life and a new beginning for them. And that God, as we take that step, we begin to see the kingdom. We begin to enter into the kingdom of God. And Lord, we pray that in that moment, you would begin to change everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Lucas, for that reminder and challenge to allow the Holy Spirit to shift our perspectives and our opinions from our flesh to the Spirit. Well, we have some announcements right now for you, including our much anticipated Easter Sunday announcement. Yeah, so the first of the weekend is actually Good Friday, and so we're so excited to gather online for Good Friday. It's gonna be a little bit of a different, uh, more creative, kind of service, and so we're really excited to do that online with you. It's a different time than usual, it's at 6.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. And so we're uh, just kind of continuing with tradition where usually our Good Friday services are in the evenings here at Evangel. And so we're gonna be doing that together. If you made it here this morning, then you followed all of the right pathway to get here for Friday as well, because uh, we'll be premiering it on Facebook and YouTube, but we would love to have you join us for Good Friday. We sure would, and then on Easter Sunday, we would love to have you here in the building. Yeah. We will still be online at nine o'clock if you don't feel comfortable yet gathering mm -hmm. together or you just can't for whatever reason, you can join us right here. But we have been given the green light yeah. to go ahead with in-person gatherings and we are so excited. You can register for both of those at myevangel.church uh, because we will have a nine o'clock and an 11 o'clock right. service. Just read through all of the information. We still will be requiring masks indoors, mm -hmm. just like they do everywhere in BC. So we would love to see you there. And then because it's Easter weekend, we're gonna be closing our office on Monday. Mm -hmm. And so if you come in that day, uh, we unfortunately won't be here, but we'll be back in the office again Tuesday. Thank you so much uh, just for understanding and allowing us to have a day of rest. Yeah, and a day of Easter cabbie. Of course. Get all those mini eggs, you know? And you know what? Maybe right now you can say if you're having a turkey or a ham for your Easter celebration. I have not decided yet. We are always a turkey family. We have one more announcement for you, and that is that we had so much fun with our hashtag date yeah, night challenge. Yeah, it was so fun. But we have a new hashtag challenge for you. It's gonna be Friday, April 9th, and the hashtag is we love PR, as yep. in we love Powell River. So what we want you to do is go to all of your favorite places, whether that's a coffee shop or a restaurant or a hike somewhere, snap a picture, post it on social media with the hashtag we love PR, and mm -hmm. we will share your posts on Evangel's page and you know make the rest of the world jealous. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, even if you're joining our stream here and you don't live in Powell River, feel free to take a picture too and tag us in it. We would love to extend it. I know that we're saying we love PR and that's where we are here, but we want to include you as well. And so if you have a place in your city that you love, don't feel like you're excluded from this. Just take a picture and tag us in it as well. Or if you've been to Powell River in the past, oh, yeah. post an old photo and there you go. It would just be fun to share some Powell River love. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning and we are so looking forward to seeing you in person next week. Have a great weekend. See you friends.